welcome to Bread and Roses. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Boris Puya. We're really sorry. We haven't had our program for a while now. It's all his fault. Uh, you um, won't believe that, would you? But, uh, yeah, they believe it. But we're really, really glad to be back. And we hope you're looking forward to the programs we prepare for you on a weekly basis. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about blasphemy because of course it's international blasphemy day today interview this week is with ali rizvi author on freedom of conscience and leaving islam our insane fatwa is about buffaloes behinds and provocation and our slice of life is a wonderful historical protest march in stockholm in support of the mothers of those killed in the bloody decade of the 80s in Iran. Stay with us, don't go away. Today is International Blasphemy Day and we thought that it would be important to speak about blasphemy. We know that in 71 countries out of 195 there are still blasphemy laws on the books including European countries like Italy and Ireland and of course we know that in 13 countries blasphemy is punishable by death and we know very clearly that they are all Islamic states. And we could see many examples uh, of uh, punishment uh, about death. We've had many people, for example, in Iran, uh, you remember the case of Sina Dehgan and many, many political prisoners currently on death row because they are charged with uh, um, insulting uh, Prophet Muhammad or Islam. Uh, and we also have seen Saudi Arabia, we have Rauf Badawi still in prison because he wanted to criticize the religious government and constitution of the Saudi Arabia many many islamic countries uh, it openly state punishes people uh, for for blasphemy and of course we know it's not just islamic states they're the worst culprits uh, but uh, also even european countries like italy has a uh, imprisonment term for those who've been considered blasphemous uh, you've got uh, ireland as well still has uh, blasphemy laws on its books no, absolutely in italy uh, as you mentioned a, a football player um, you know during the course of football has uh, made the statement saying god damn it and he's been barred from playing football or uh, um, uh, a coach has been sort of uh, threatened with expulsion from a, a football team. In the, so the, 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 the pressure to impose blasphemy is continuing. We've had that in India, for example, the chief minister, uh, Mr. Singh of Punjab uh, uh, region, he's proposing to change the constitution of India uh, to make it uh, a crime punishable uh, well, life imprisonment uh, for if uh, anybody questions or uh, insults the religious books. Very often governments are now equating blasphemy with terrorism because that's a way of sort of, um, you know, uh, giving a green light to be able to persecute and prosecute people who are accused of criticizing or mocking religion. And we're seeing that a lot also reflected on social media. There's this sort of the same sort of fights taking place in society. It's taking place on That's social right, media yeah. as well. So you've got people criticizing uh, religion, Islam in particular, and you've got then attempts at censorship and Absolutely. restrictions. How many of people now are friends who've actually been barred and banned and uh, it can't be deleted from Facebook because you know they, they made the statements that the censors of uh, Facebook didn't like, didn't like it. Shame on you, uh, Facebook. Yeah. But at the same time, the the resistance against blasphemy law is continuing. The demand for freedom of conscience is continuing yeah. everywhere. In Ireland, for example, in end of October, there is a referendum to remove blasphemy law, and that's a great campaign. And Atheist Ireland and other organisations is uh, they, they've been working really really hard uh, to promote this. So. Uh, you know, power to your elbow colleagues and friends in, in Ireland and we support uh, the movement to uh, remove blasphemy law uh, from uh, uh, Irish constitution. Yeah, and you had mentioned uh, social media and the restrictions. I mean, one of the things uh, a lot of ex-Muslims are calling Facebook is Ayatollah Facebook because it is imposing de facto blasphemy laws as well. And we see how that's being done in a really pernicious way. There's no blasphemy laws in, in many of these countries, 
but they're imposing it nonetheless. And many websites and Facebook pages that are dealing with atheism, with feminism, uh, with defending LGBT rights, we've seen them being shut down without any uh, explanation. And so that's another area of the battle uh, against uh, these sort of blasphemy laws. Yeah, and the right to think freely, the right to freedom of conscience, it's part of being human. If that's restricted, a humanity has been taken away. Then you can't criticize your living condition, working condition, you know, states uh, and religious institution. That becomes end of humanity. So the, the, the fight against blasphemy law is part and parcel of freedom of conscience, freedom of being human and freedom to think independently. So, you know, we want to, uh, in every country, blasphemy laws to be abolished. Yeah, blasphemy is really what is called a victimless crime. There's no crime. There's no victim. It's about expressing one's thoughts and beliefs, uh, criticizing religion, which is just an idea. And, you know, ideas have to be open to criticism. And so defending the right to blasphemy is an integral part to defending freedom of conscience and freedom of belief. You cannot have real freedom of conscience and freedom of belief without the right to be free from religion and to criticize religion. It's a great pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to speak to you about your book, The yeah. Atheist Muslim. It seems like a contradictory title, doesn't it? It does, and uh, the publishers love that, right? As you know, this is a very catchy title. Uh, but uh, it's not a self-descriptor. What it actually is is it addresses the countless uh, atheist, agnostic, secularist, people who live in the Muslim world who have to publicly identify as Muslim because if they don't not only are they disowned by their families or ostracized or marginalized from their communities and their society uh, but they can be prosecuted I mean they can be uh, put in jail they can be hacked to death like the bloggers in Bangladesh they can be uh, flogged like Raif Badawi in, in uh, Saudi Arabia so this speaks to them uh, they're closeted, they're atheist in thought, but they're Muslim in presentation um, because they're forced to be. And, and those are the atheist Muslims. Their, their existence is contradictory, they're living a contradiction. So the title addresses and respects that. And, uh, you know, you talk about all these people who've got in touch with you, who mm -hmm. uh, feel that this, even this title speaks to them. And it also speaks to you, too, with the uh, things that you like, parts of the things that you like and things that you don't. Right. Um, can you explain that a bit? Yeah, when I, uh, when I announced the title initially, I started hearing from a lot of people in the Muslim world who were atheistic, or they were secular at least, and uh, they said, oh, that describes me, that's who I am. And it was a different story for different people. So for some of them, you know, they, uh, they were closeted. They said, I can't speak about this, and so I, but I have to go to the Juma prayer, I have to pretend like I'm Muslim. Uh, just to avoid, you know, all of the things we talked about, the persecution. Now, there are others who said, you know, my mother's a hijabi, my family's really religious, and they raised me really well. I love them a lot. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to alienate them. I believe that they're good people. I just don't believe in the religion itself. And uh, so, you know, they celebrate Eid or they celebrate the rituals and the, and the holidays, but they, they don't carry the belief. And uh, this is when I started seeing a split between Islamic ideology and Muslim identity. When I realized Islam and Muslim are two very different words. Um, Islam is an idea, it's defined by the scripture. You know, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can't deviate from it. If you do, uh, it's called heresy, it's called blasphemy, it's called apostasy. There's you know, different degrees of terms for it. Uh, on the other hand, Muslim, is uh, really is not a monolith. I mean, you've got uh, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. The vast majority of them don't even speak the language of the Quran, which is Arabic. You know, the largest populations are in Indonesia and India, Bangladesh, and Turkey, Iran. None of these are English speaking. So, uh, are Arabic speaking, I'm sorry. So, they, the, the, the Muslims as a community, the Muslim identity is much, much more diverse, and there's a lot more heterogeneity 
um, and diversity in the way that people think. And Islamic ideolo identity is a completely uh, different thing. That, that's really what the book uh, discusses. And so do you talk a bit about your own uh, journey as well? I mean, what made you uh, become an atheist and uh, even mm -hmm. and, and write this book? Yes, yeah, so the, so the, uh, the book is um, semi-memoir. It is a lot of it is a memoir, uh, and I do talk about how I was raised. And I, I grew up in uh, three different Muslim majority countries: uh, in Libya, in Saudi Arabia, and in Pakistan. And um, you know, one is in North Africa, the other is uh, the birthplace of Islam and Muhammad, and the third is a South Asian country where Islam came later. Uh, so there were very different perspectives. I saw the interplay of the religion and the culture and you know, language and uh, all of these different elements and how they come together. And being exposed to that pushed me towards secularism quite a bit. And I also went to an American school in Riyadh, uh, which was strange because there were people with around 80 different nationalities in our school. And outside it was the Taliban with a lot of money, right? Because that's what Saudi Arabia is even now. Uh, and I, so it makes you think, you know, it makes you process the world differently than most people do when you have that experience. And I thought a lot about it, and, and a lot of that journey is described in the book, both not only culturally and what I was exposed to, but also the intellectual journey, or how I went about questioning the beliefs, and you know, also have a science background and so on. So there are many factors that played into it uh, that are in it, that are in there. It's interesting because in your talk at the Muslimish conference recently, you mm -hmm. talked about um, the scientific claims of the Quran, right. and uh, given your own background as a doctor, it's, mm -hmm. it was interesting to hear. Uh, can you talk a bit about those, uh, you know, the, the things that are said about that and yeah. reality? There is, uh, oh, I, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> and And this is, I think, one thing that isn't, really unique to Islam, this is across all religions, uh, that there is this idea that science answers the how questions and religion answers the why questions, uh, which is not true because religion pretends to answer the why questions and it does make many scientific claims. It makes claims about the, how, you, how the universe started, it claim, makes claims about uh, how human beings came into existence. Um, uh, it, it makes all these strange supernatural claims like, you know, men living inside fish and uh, you know, a man flying up to heaven on a winged horse, resurrection after death, uh, virgin births. So all, all of these are scientific claims, and they can be refuted. Uh, so uh, the, what people talk a lot about when it comes to the Quran, a lot of the apologists talk about the embryological claims. And I always found this, even back when I was a little bit religious, I always found this absurd because uh, it's very easy to see through. You know, when they said that the... Um, the embryo looks like a blood clot or you know God uh, Allah clothed bones with flesh and how these are supposedly miraculous things to have said in the seventh century well Aristotle did it with chick embryos you know there's uh, what the Quran describes is if you take an egg a fertilized chicken egg you open it up at different stages and you just describe what you see um, that, that's all it is. There, there's, there's nothing miraculous about it. There's nothing. Uh, Aristotle wrote about it. Galen wrote about it before, uh, and you know, in I think the third century BC or even earlier than that. So I never found this original. I don't know why people are so enamored with it, and that includes um, internationally renowned embryologists like Keith L. Moore, uh, who now he's gone back on it, but at that time uh, he was he was very enamored by it. So I, I, I like to have those discussions. I like to refute them. Uh, I enjoy talking to Muslims who make those claims and uh, discussing why I think that they're wrong. And, and there's a whole chapter in my book called Choosing Atheism. I think it's chapter five. Uh, so I, I went through a lot of those claims specifically and a lot of the verses in the Quran uh, about embryology and about science and uh, talked about how they can be refuted very easily. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, for someone who is thinking about becoming an atheist or questioning uh, religion, what are some of your main arguments uh, when it comes to Islam? Uh, mm -hmm. Like someone in Iran watching this program right now, uh, 
My uh, main argument, what I tell people who believe, is uh, that if you want to get to know me and you can't see me, supposing I'm, I'm dead and, you know, it's a long time afterwards, you're going to try to see what I left behind. The way to get to know me is to read my books, see what I created. Um, and if you do believe that a creator created this universe around you, right? if you believe that a creator created nature, then study nature. You don't have to go to a book thousands of years ago or a hearsay from a messiah or a prophet who claimed you know, that they were sent by God. You have nature around you today. You can study it. And there's a word for that. The study of nature is called science. And the language of science is not Arabic. It's not Hebrew. It's, Arama it's not Aramaic. The language of science is mathematics. And mathematics, unlike the other languages, stays the same, whether you're in Israel, whether you're in Gaza, whether you're on the moon. And it's better to ask real questions than take refuge in false answers. And that's, the, that's how I would sum it up. Uh, I mean, some would say that um, there isn't a contradiction between religion and science. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess, um, uh, is that something you might, you, you obviously wouldn't agree with, but why? Or do you think uh, there's any way that religion and science can be accommodated? Well, uh, in reality, there are people who are able to compartmentalize uh, parts of their mind to process religion, process science. Uh, but the reason that I think that they're not compatible is because they work, they work in completely different ways. Faith, by definition, means believing things without evidence. Like, I, I don't have faith that this chair I'm sitting on exists. I know it exists because I have, you know, there's evidence. I can observe it. Uh, but faith means that uh, I have to believe things and there's absolutely no evidence. There's nothing I can observe. You know, so that, that, with faith, you can believe anything. And the problem is that with faith, you start with a conclusion and then you go backwards. Right? So you already have a conclusion. The Quran is the word of God. Muhammad was a messenger of God. And uh, now we're going to go back and we're going to look at the science and see where it fits. So it, it, you're automatically in a position of selection and confirmation bias. Um, with science, you, you generate a hypothesis and you don't try to just prove it right. You try to prove it wrong. Right? So falsifiability, hypothesis generation, null hypothesis generation. The scientific method is based on starting out with the presumption that you're wrong, which is the opposite of a conclusion, and then working along, picking up evidence in, in an unbiased way, and then landing at a conclusion. And even those conclusions are often not hard and fast. You, you never, proof is, the word proof is a taboo word in science. You say that there's evidence for something or another. You don't say that this has been proven or not. So I, I, I feel that's more honest. Yeah, I think that it's a completely different phenomenon from the way faith works. It's actually antithetical to it. So not only are they not compatible, uh, they, they work against each other. And this is why historically there's been such, they've been at loggerheads with each other for so long. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. The Insane Fatwa this week comes from the Iranian State Broadcasting Service and it's censoring a nature program and it has something to do with buffaloes. Basically, they censored buffaloes coming out of the water and when yes. the censor asked, uh, when the screenwriters asked, why are you censoring came back very, the buffalo? Very, very definite answer that the waffle, buffalo coming out of water and filming it from Bat's backside, he may encourage people having a strange It's thoughts. provocative. I'm, I'm sweating right now thinking of a buffalo coming yes. out of a water. <laughs> it's just... This is the morality of... I need, uh, I need a fan. <laughs> this is the morality of the um, Islamic government in power. Yeah, in and Iran. it's interesting because the screenwriter asked them, why since why the buffalo they didn't quite get it because of course the human mind does not go to the places that the islamic regime's yes. mind goes and they said that it's because they need to instill public morality public morality Requires emerges from water buffaloes no gets, buffaloes it needs, gets covered 
by yeah. the Islamic censors. It's got to stop. And of course, uh, did you see there was also this thing about uh, they had some Italian team on the TV and its logo had a wolf. It's a wolf with yeah, yeah, uh, the, the, the Roma, the, you know, the wolf and, and the children yes, suck, you know. suckling and off the, the teats and they had censored the teats of the they wolf. They had to cover it. In a football match, they had to cover the logo of Raisi, uh, AS, uh, I think Roma. That's people. public morality for you. Got to watch out. Don't look at buffaloes if you can help it. Any it's naked animal. Dangerous. <laughs> any naked, naked animal. animal. <laughs> cover your animals. Otherwise, the Islamists forget. Well, crops, isn't so. that why the Taliban had put nappies on donkeys and they bulls did. and the same thing. On the 15th of September, there was a huge event in Stockholm. Hundreds of Iranian political dissidents and their supporters, they came out carrying a huge banner with the photos of many of those killed during the 80s, which is called the Bloody Decade in Iran. And it was such a wonderful sight to see. It was a historic demonstration and protest in support of the mothers of those who'd been killed, the mothers of Havaran. And also, it was... Uh, in, in continuation of that demand for justice and some sort of accountability for Absolutely. those who've been killed. I think seeking justice uh, and accountability or, and bringing those uh, to account and to book those who've actually committed, you know, murder or in, on massive scale in Iran during the 80s. And that essence of the Islamic regime has continued throughout its history. Uh, so this organization of Iran Tribunal, support of many other organizations who are seeking release of political prisoners and they want to bring accountability and show to the world the crimes that the Islamists have committed in Iran and that's and that's the important thing has been the core of the demand of the Iranian people and that's such an important event that is taking place in Stockholm. Yeah and as you said there's you know there's been killings going on throughout the 40-year history of the Iranian regime. The 80s are particularly bloody and they've been considered a crime against humanity by Iran tribunal. They set up a court and had uh, various justices look at the evidence and find that actually crimes against humanity had taken place. And so this is great to see this sort of continuation of this pressure. We're never going to forget. No one wants revenge, but accountability is a must. Justice is a must. And of course, this sort of uh, links with other movements across the world yes. that have fought for accountability. Mothers in particular, you know, that's you've right. got the mothers of Havaran, that's a burial ground where where political prisoners were buried in mass graves with mothers in other countries. In Argentina, mothers of Argentina actually sent the message of solidarity, justice for Iranian people. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We're so glad to be back. We hope this was an interesting program for you. And we're going to see you again next week at the same time and same place. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us.
Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.